clearly articulated purpose, consciously embodied by the leadership, should be an essential element in all business organizations while also enhancing shareholder value. John, I'm going to interrupt you when you have five minutes to go, one minute to go, and 30 seconds just to warn you. Uh, so take it away, John, on that resolution. Go ahead. Thanks, Gene. I'm going to bring my slides up now. Okay, great. So anyway, sorry I can't be with you. I tried very hard to get there. Bad weather, what can I say? So this debate resolution is, is a mouthful, isn't it? A clearly articulated purpose consciously invited by the leadership should be an essential element in all business organizations, while also enhancing shareholder value. What the heck does that actually mean? Um, we couldn't quite get an agreement on the topic, and this was somewhat of a compromise, I think, but essentially the way I interpret it is that does business have a higher purpose besides only maximizing profits? And uh, yeah, I think it does. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So let me declare my bias up front. I am a fanatical capitalist. I believe capitalism is the most important thing that humanity has collectively ever done. And I'm going to demonstrate that briefly because people need to understand how incredible capitalism is. Starting with, we can see the increasing wealth that capitalism has produced. For most of human history, humans have been incredibly poor. It wasn't until capitalism and the Industrial Revolution that humanity began to, to escape its poverty conditions. If you go back, it's, it's unprecedented. Just 200 years ago, the world's economy was at the level of Sierra Leone is today. 94% of everyone alive were, were poor. Now the per capita income has grown by over 10x, it's over 24x in the United States, 41x in Hong Kong, 75x in South Korea. It's incredible. How about poverty? Again, 94% of everyone alive back in 1820 was living on less than $2 a day in today's dollar, 94%. 85% lived on less than $1 a day. Economic freedom has a lot to do with whether or not how, how economically prosperous any type of country is. The more economically free it is, the higher the GDP per capita. The poorest people, it's better to be poor in a country like the United States with economic freedom than in another poorer country. So economic freedom also helps the poorest. Life expectancy has gone from about 30 years, 200 years ago now to 72.6 across the world and usually close to 80 in more developed economically prosperous countries. Illiteracy, it's hard to believe, but 200 years ago, 88% of every human being alive was, was illiterate, and that's dropped now down to about 12%. Here's the Economic Freedom Index. I put this up there to make a couple of points. The first one is, is the United States, which would have been number, has been number one, number two, or number three for most of our history. Um, it's fall, we've fallen. Uh, our economic freedom is in decline in the United States. And as a result, our prosperity, while still very good, is, is not, it's not growing at the same rate that it once did. I put this up here because the Nordic countries were held out as great examples of socialism. And in fact, their economic freedom is extremely high. They don't think of them, they think of themselves as capitalistic, not socialistic. And Denmark and Iceland actually have higher degrees of economic freedom than the United States. And these other countries are pretty darn close. So I'm going to argue that business is fundamentally good because we are the value creators in the world. Business creates value through voluntary exchange with customers and with all of the different stakeholders it, it trades with. We are the great value creators. We create far more value than all of the governments and all of the nonprofits in the world combined exponentially. And business is ethical because we, we make the money that we make because it, we do it through voluntary exchange, not through coercion, not through guns. No one's forced to trade with Whole Foods Market, for example. If you don't like Whole Foods, if you think we're too expensive, if you don't like our quality, if you don't like our selection, if you don't like our service, you, you go to one of our competitors. And that means everyone that trades with us 
is doing so because they believe it's in their self-interest to do so. And business is noble because it can elevate our existence. And finally, business is heroic because it's business that's lifting people out of poverty. It's business that has taken that 94% of the people living on less than $2 a day down to under 10%. Okay, capitalism is great. I did all that because of this slide. Capitalism is the most wonderful system humanity has ever created, but it's, it's deeply disliked. It's hated in many cases. Here you can see from these polls, and the Gallup poll shows that confidence in big business is only about 23%. I mean, 77% don't have any confidence in big business. The heart research shows that 83% of Americans think that the government benefits big corporations and the wealthy, but it, it not over the middle class. Roper shows 2%, only 2% of investors believe CEOs, like myself, are very trustworthy. And 72% believe wrongdoing is commonplace at companies. In 2018, only 45% of millennials had a positive view of capitalism, while 51% had a positive view of socialism. That's astounding. Why has it happened? It's happened because the motives of business are misunderstood. The anti-capitalists have created a negative narrative about capitalism and business. The anti-capitalists, largely the intellectuals who control and teach at our universities, they've always hated business. They've always persecuted it throughout history. This is not, this is not new. Business is portrayed as greedy and selfish and exploitative and fundamentally not good. And finally, the defenders of capitalism have done a terrible job of defending the purpose and ethics of business. They oftentimes, when the critics of capitalism say, you know, it, capitalism is all about greed. It's all about selfishness. It's all about exploitation. Many of the defenders say, yeah, it is. So what? Yeah, people are naturally selfish. People are naturally greedy. And so capitalism takes advantage of that and helps and that by by basically using those motives business and capitalism through the invisible hand create prosperity in the world i think when we take that defense we've automatically lost the debate with the average person who who doesn't see selfishness as good who doesn't see greed as something that uh, uh that they see it as gordon gecko uh uh, said in, in Wall Street, they think it's not good. <laughs> and so the ethics of capitalism are mistrusted and disliked. And so these are the three reasons why I think capitalism is the great system that has led to the prosperity. And yet we're in danger of losing it in the United States um, because of these three major reasons. So that leads me to conscious capitalism. I'll talk briefly about this. I don't have that much time in 15 minutes. But it's fundamentally a new narrative, a new way to think about business. And we have four tenets, a higher purpose, stakeholder interdependence, conscious leadership, and conscious cultures. And so this debate's primarily about purpose. And I'm gonna argue that businesses need to shift from focusing on profit maximization to purpose maximization. And what is the purpose of a business in the first place? Why does business exist. And it's it's kind of, if you go to a party and you ask people randomly what the purpose of business is, they'll look at you quizzically because they'll think, they'll say, what do you mean what's the purpose of business? Everybody knows the purpose of business. The purpose of business is to make money, right? That's an odd answer. Because if you think about every other profession, what's the purpose of a doctor? Doctors make a lot of money. Doctors are well compensated but that's not their purpose. Their purpose is to help heal people, right? Teachers educate, architects design buildings, engineers construct things. Every one of the professions refers back to a higher purpose that's in type of creating value for other people in service of the greater public good. Great companies have great purposes. Amazon, parent company of Whole Foods now. Our vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. Google, 
Our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And the Whole Foods Market, what I help co-found and lead. Our purpose is to nourish people in the planet. And that has been our purpose all the, since the very beginning, over 43 years ago now. The importance of stakeholders. All stakeholders matter. Sure, the investors matter. Of course, we should try to make as much money as possible for our investors. But all the other stakeholders matter too. Customers matter, employers matter, employees matter, suppliers matter, and the larger community matters. They're all interdependent. They're all connected together. And what I've learned in business is we have to manage the business consciously to create value for all of these stakeholders. And when we do that, we optimize profits. We optimize shareholder value. Leadership is extremely important as well. Right. We must be the change that we wish the world to be, see in the world. That's what Gandhi said. And as leaders, as conscious leaders, we must embody the higher purpose of the organization, the values that the organization is trying to realize in the world. When Raj Sasodi and I did our research for conscious capitalism, these were the qualities and virtues that conscious leaders uh, com continually uh, uh, embody. More authentic, emotionally intelligent, service-oriented, high integrity, more spiritually evolved, more purpose-driven. Some of the things conscious leaders do, we create a shared purpose. This is a picture of a Whole Foods, that's our team. Uh, we've got 100,000 people working for our company. And they stick around for two main reasons, purpose and love, as well as, of course, compensation. We, we're here to make a positive difference in the world. Conscious leaders are here to make the world better in some significant way. We help people to grow and evolve. We help create win-win-win strategies. We do not simply work in terms of trade-offs. We're constantly seeking to optimize all of the stakeholders to create value for all of them simultaneously. We practice servant leadership. As Albert Schweitzer said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. Conscious leaders serve the higher purpose of the organization. They serve all of the stakeholders. And in doing that, the business prospers and that helps the investor prosper. Higher purpose matters in business. Business is not a profit maximization game. Business is not a machine. Business is not an algorithm. It may use algorithms, but that's not what it is. Business is certainly not war. It's not hyper competition. It's not a Darwinian survival game of the fittest, survival of the fittest game. Fundamentally, business is about the lives of real people. It is one of the most human things that we can do. We must therefore measure our success by the way in which we fulfill our, highest, our higher purpose as individuals and as business organization and how we improve the lives of other people. If we do that, then if we embody these qualities, if we live with purpose, if our organizations consciously create value for other people, we will create and optimize shareholder value as well. I urge you to vote yes for the affirmative in this debate resolution tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, now, uh, Yaron Brook, who is the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, uh, will speak for the negative for 15 minutes. Take it away, Yaron. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Uh, thank you, Gene, for organizing this, and thank you, John, who's somewhere there, um, for agreeing, agreeing to do this debate. Uh, when Gene first approached me about this debate, we went through a whole number of different resolutions. And as you can see, John and I agree on much. And the nuance of how to structure resolutions so that we would actually have a debate instead of a agreement festival uh, was, was a real challenge. Uh, I think, though, we found something we actually 
disagree about, and that is, uh, that is good. But let me, let me first say that it's an honor for me to be debating John Mackey. I'm a huge admirer of his, uh, obviously as a, an incredibly successful CEO, as an incredibly successful businessman who has created enormous amounts of wealth and shareholder value, uh, and as somebody who has indeed changed, I think, uh, a lot of our lives, or at least those of us who are customers and associated with Whole Foods. So, um, so it, it, it really is an honor and a pleasure for me to, to be debating John. Uh, also, John is an advocate for capitalism. Uh, uh, you know, and it's, uh, you saw the graphs. And of course, we agree on all of that, on all the good stuff that capitalism provides. If you know anything about me, I spend my life traveling the world, trying to explain to people the value of capitalism and, and, and uh, the benefits that it has provided humanity or anybody who's been willing to try even a little bit of it. Right? To the extent that people try capitalism, people try freedom, to that extent they are successful uh, as, as societies, as countries, from an economic but also social and life extension in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, longevity by every measure of human well-being. But what's interesting is that we've got all this success for the last, if you look at those graphs from before, really for the last 250 years, we've had this amazing success of capitalism. Capitalism has produced all these amazing goods and it's extended our life and increased the quality of our living and by every measure has been fantastic. And yet, it was all done, or mostly done, for the most part done, in the name of what? in the name of profit maximization. Now, let me be clear about what I mean by profit. I don't mean the counting number that comes at the end of an of a, of a income statement because we know that that can be manipulated and changed and so on. I'm talking about economic profit. I'm talking about the value created above and beyond the resources deployed to create a good. So over the long run, right? So it's over the long run, the real value created through a particular activity, whether it's a service or manufacturing, that produces something that didn't exist before. Right. So profit is not an accounting number, necessarily. It is a projection about the added benefit over the long run that a particular activity will generate. We often use the term shareholder wealth maximization, which again, and I, I, I apologize for being technical, it's not very technical, this is very simple, is basically the sum of those future profits, or at least ideally represents that sum of those future profits. So when we talk about shareholder wealth maximization, we're talking about trying to maximize the profitability of a business over the long run. And indeed, that's what implicitly almost every capitalist businessman has done for the last 250 years, and that increase in wealth, prosperity, life expectancy, all that stuff is not just some hypothetical thing. You know, it was created by capitalism, which is some floating abstraction above our heads. That was created by business people, by business people like John, working unbelievably hard, unbelievably smart, creating businesses and making a lot of money. But how do you make money? How, do, how, how come all of us are better off because they made money? In a 250 years ago, that would have been a real head-scratcher, right? But how is it that we are better off when they make money? Because the only way for them to make money, the only way a business makes money, is by providing us, all of us, whether we're part of the business or not, with a value. We buy their products. We buy their products for, what it, for more than what it costs them to produce. That's the profit. And yet, our lives are better off as well. John referred to this as win-win. He added a third win. Well, maybe we'll get to that third win later, but I'll just deal with two wins. The business wins because it makes a profit. I win because I got a value that I didn't have before. We're both better off. And that's what capitalism has been about for the last 250 years. That gaining a profit and improving all of our lives in the process. 
But we have a PR problem. Capitalism has a PR problem. Business has a PR problem. And John articulated it. The world doesn't like us. Or like those of us who are capitalists, or those of us who are in business, or those of us who made a lot of money in business. We have a PR problem, we are told. And we do. You saw all those, I won't repeat, all the uh, statistics about how people view business. Now, why is this? Why do they view us so horrifically? Is it because they don't know the history? Well, to some extent, people don't know. Is it because they don't understand? Well, to some extent, they don't understand. There's a gap in our economics education. There's a gap in our history education. There's certainly gaps of knowledge. But there's a much more fundamental core reason why they don't buy the story. And John alluded to it. It's because in their mind, the activity of business, the activity of generating a profit, is fundamentally a self-interested activity. It's the business is making a profit for itself. Yes, everybody it touches, almost, not everybody, I don't think that all stakeholders benefit, but most people it touches benefit as well. But some people get really, really rich, really, really successful. Some people are benefiting enormously. And they are labeled self-interested, and they are self-interested. John, it's not just about the money, I believe him, but it's about his purpose, and it's about his passion. That's part of his self-interest. So yes, CEOs, businesses do pursue their own self-interest. But we live in a culture where self-interest is viewed morally, ethically, as a negative, as a bad thing, as something to be avoided. Where selflessness, where being Mother Teresa is viewed as an ideal. Right. And part of my objection to John's approach in conscious capitalism and conscious leadership is he's trying to take an ethic of selflessness and altruism, not quite, you know, he, he softens it, and merge it with clearly an economic, social, political activity, or social and economic activity, that is self-interested. It just is. And what most libertarians do, unfortunately, is they accept the status quo when it comes to morality. They accept the status quo about ethics that exists in our culture. And they want to somehow take capitalism and fix it, and merge it, and twist it into that ethical framework. And Ayn Rand provides us with a real alternative. And that alternative is an alternative moral code. It's not to reject ethics. It's not to reject morality. But to center that ethics and to center that morality on self-interest. From a business perspective, on the profit motive. Profit is not something to be shunned. It's not something to be explained and softened and build purposes around it. Profit is value creation. With very few exceptions. There is no profit without the long term, without the creation of value. I'm not talking about GameStop, right? GameStop is profit without value creation. <laughs> but that's rare and unusual. And most of the people who made a profit from GameStop, my guess is, are going to lose it because it's not a winning strategy. Over the long run, profit is value creation. Financial markets price companies based on their ability to create value long term. Now, I know John disagrees with this. I, I, I read his book where, where I think some of our disagreements got sharpened, um, by, by, which I recommend. I think everybody should read it. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting uh, stuff there and a lot of stuff that I agree with. But there's also stuff I don't. Five minutes. No, no, five minutes. Five minutes. Thanks. Markets are very good at identifying and pricing value. Many of us spend our lives and our, our professional lives at refining and improving markets to better reflect real value. Other, in other words, the profit potential of a business. 
So I propose an alternative resolution that focuses on what I think is business is really about. Business is about making money, and we shouldn't run away from that. It's about, it's different than nonprofits. It's different than clubs and other types of organizations. The purpose of business is to take the inputs that the world provides us. Those inputs are raw materials, those inputs are technologies, those inputs are ideas, those inputs are human, those inputs are capital. And rearrange them in a way that adds value. And that additional value is reflected in the profit they make. So to say I want a business to maximize shareholder wealth means I want the business to maximize the value they create. Those two are synonymous. You cannot increase profits over the long run without doing exactly that, without creating that kind of value. So I propose that the purpose of a business is to maximize shareholder wealth by creating value in the marketplace within the context, and I agree with John with regard to kind of the way he views, some of the way he views purpose, within the context of a clearly articulated mission, and you could add consciously embodied by the leadership. Where consciously would mean, to me at least, rational, thoughtful, fully focused, fully intentional. I would take out some of the things that John probably would include under conscious. So, the alternative, when you're voting now, right? The purpose of a business is to maximize shareholder wealth, maximize long-term profit, if that's easier to think of, within the context, by creating value, within the context of a clearly articulated mission, consciously embodied by its leadership. I think that is consistent with what business actually does. It's consistent with a philosophy with an idea that says profit is good, but profit is moral, profit is virtuous by its very nature as a value creator in a voluntary society in which we exchange and therefore are creating value for ourselves. Nothing, we should never apologize for creating value for ourselves. And yes, for everybody else, otherwise you don't profit. If you create stuff just for you, it's called a hobby. In order to make it a business, you have to create value for other people. And that value is reflected in profits. Let's not shy away from that. Thank you all. Thank you, Yaron. Uh, yeah, you, you can hear me on the... Uh, uh, we now go to uh, the rebuttal portion of the debate. That's uh, five minutes for each person. Uh, John, I take it you heard what Yaron said, and uh, uh, we give you five minutes of rebuttal and comments. Take it away, John. Yaron is right. We agree about many things. We both um, we believe in liberty. We believe in freedom. We believe in profit. So is profit good? He, he argues profit's good. Hey, profit is good. Profit's wonderful. I love profits. Whole Foods Markets made billions and billions of dollars. We founded the company. So profit is good. But he says business is about making money. And I don't think it is. I think he's confused. He's confused the result with purpose. And maybe the best way to explain it is through an analogy. So my body produces red blood cells. And if it stopped producing red blood cells, I would die. But it doesn't logically follow that just because my body must produce red blood cells that its purpose is to produce red blood cells. I have a more transcendent purpose than simply trying to produce red blood cells. And similarly, business must make money. If business does not make money, it will die. But that doesn't mean that's why it exists. Profit comes as a result of creating value for other people. And the higher purpose of a business is found in that value creation. That's why it exists. It exists to create value for other people. If it does a good job at that, it will make money. It will make profit. I think he's putting the cart before the horse. Um, he asked, he's talked about win-win. 
And I, I argue for a win-win-win. And what, what that means is when we make exchange, a good exchange should be something that's good for you and good for me, but also good for the larger community, particularly the larger community of stakeholders. I can give an example to get you to see my point. Let's say um, you wanted to murder somebody. You could contract with a, uh, you know a guy who knows a guy, and you contract to kill that person. That would be, and you pay uh, $50,000 to have this person murdered. Well, that would be a win for the, uh, the person you contract with. Uh, they're getting $50,000. That'd be a win for you. You're getting rid of somebody that you don't want to have around, exist any longer. But is that a win for the larger society? It's not. It clearly is not. And so win-win isn't good enough. We need to create win-win-win type of arrangements where it's good for you, good for me, and good for the larger community that we're part of. Um, I always feel like when I talk to uh, objectivists that I'm I'm talking to uh, straw man. I'm always arguing against the straw man argument that it's it's of course human beings are self-interested. It's it's obvious that we are. I I don't say that's a bad thing that we're self-interested. I I reject sort of a philosophy that human beings should be completely altruistic in all circumstances. But it's a straw man argument because any, if you look at human nature, you can see that human beings are clearly both. We are, we are, we are self-interested and we are also capable of love. We're capable and love, we're capable of generosity and kindness and forgiveness and compassion and gratitude and care. We do both. We are self-interested and we care about others. And business isn't just about maximizing profits. It's about creating value for other people. We are both self-interested and we care about other people. So it, I always, it's always frustrating to me because I've, I've had this argument before and I can never get the complexity of human nature cannot be explained strictly in the terms of self-interest. To me, it's contradictory, although I do not want this debate to turn into a debate about what self-interest means, what selfishness means, what benevolence, me benevolence means, what altruism means. I just appeal to the audience to examine your own common experience. And aren't you both? Aren't you both? I mean, yes, there are some few sociopaths out there who really don't care about anybody else. Maybe that's 5% of the population, but 95% of the people are not sociopaths. 95% are self-interested and care about other people. They want to make money and they want to fulfill a higher profit, profit uh, a higher purpose. We're both. Um, I want to maximize profit at Whole Foods Market. I do. and But that comes because I want to maximize value for our customers. I want to maximize value for our our, our employees, I want to maximize value for our suppliers, I want to maxi maximize value for our investors, and I want to maximize value for our communities. That's a conscious leader attempts to do all of those things simultaneously. We, we are taught to think in terms of trade-off. One thing capitalism has sh shown the world is that it's not a zero-sum game where someone wins and somebody else loses. We can create, capitalism creates systems where all the different stakeholders can simultaneously win. The conscious leader does that. Every business has the potential for a higher purpose. And it, yes, it can have a higher purpose and it can maximize profits. There's no contradiction. They, they can simultaneously. I'm done. John went over by about two minutes. <laughs> what? Repeat? 50 seconds? Okay, you got an extra 50 seconds in your rebuttal. Go ahead. I expect every last second. No. <laughs> okay. Selfish. Go ahead. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> and there are no sociopaths in this audience. We know that. So uh, we've cleared that one up. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, I, I don't want to get into the debate about uh, selfishness. That's not, although it's, I think, relevant to this, uh, to this discussion. Um, but I find it funny that I was just accused of straw manning. And in doing so, John Strowman me. So, and that's part of what, what happens when you get into this. But uh, no, I care about other people. You know why? 
<laughs> because I care about myself. You are part of my world. I care about you because you provide me value. Uh, it's not because I'm half altruistic and half self-interested. And let me, I'll just add this. I wish, it's my greatest wish in the world, that people were indeed self-interested. I think the problem with the world is that we're not self-interested enough. There's way too little self-interest properly understood, just like profit properly understood, not the short-term, you know, uh, uh, under, under, undermining type, but real rational self-interest. There's just not enough of it. If there was, the world would be a much better place than there is right now. But I'd rather, I want to talk about this concept of stakeholders that John goes back to a lot. And is it, I think at the heart of, and, and I think at the heart of uh, conscious capitalism and conscious leadership as well. Everybody can be better off. Everybody can benefit. It's just not true. There are trade-offs. Of course, there are trade-offs. And you cannot make decisions based on, I want to maximize the well-being of all stakeholders. I used to run this uh, exercise with my students. I used to take a board and say, okay, let's list all the stakeholders. And you'd be surprised, and I think John would agree, how many stakeholders there are. I mean, pretty much everybody who is, has any relationship to the company is a stakeholder. Some remote, some close. All potential employees are potential stakeholders. Potential suppliers are stakeholders. And you make a list of all these stakeholders on the board, and then you ask the question, Okay, now we have to make a decision about whether we're moving the plant to Mexico or not. Or to, put aside Mexico, that's politically incorrect, right? We're moving to, from Florida to Arkansas, right? Well, how do we make a decision? Well, some employees are going to be better off. Some employees are going to be worse off. They're going to be out of a job. Some suppliers will be better off. Some suppliers will be worse off. Shareholders might be better off, okay, but what about bondholders? They have more risk in moving, so they might be worse off. And you've got this chart of pluses and minuses, and what do you do? It's debilitating. It's not a mechanism by which you can make decisions. The beauty of maximizing shareholder wealth is that it optimizes for all the stakeholders. If moving the plant is indeed in shareholders' best interest, then it's going to be in certain employees' best interest. It's going to be new employees coming in. Yes, some employees will have to leave. Its suppliers are going to benefit because it's going to be more profitable. Bondholders might not like it in the long, short run, but they might like it in the long run. The beauty of maximizing shareholder or maximizing long-term profit is it integrates our decision-making. It makes it possible for us to focus on a purpose, on success, on a decision matrix rather than being completely at the whim. Because what, what actually happens? Who is, the, who is the stakeholder that's actually going to get their way? Well, it's the one that has the most political pull. And what you turn then in is business into politics. Instead of business doing what business is supposed to do, maximize value, it turns into a political tug of war. I mean, some of the example John gives in the book are examples of this. He says, for example, that you know when Amazon bought Whole Foods, they raised everybody's minimum wage to $15 because that's what Amazon did. Amazon raised everybody $15, right? And every, it's a win-win-win. Everybody wins. Except the people who are not going to be hired because the minimum wage at Amazon, which is pretty simple jobs, who are ideal for young kids and ideal for maybe reformed drug addicts or people out of jail or whatever, people who have questionable backgrounds who are not going to get $15 an hour, not even from Whole Foods, not even from Amazon. They are priced out of the market because they can't produce at 15 bucks. So I'm not saying it's a wrong thing to raise the wage within a company to 15 if that's what you decide to do. But to ignore the fact that there are trade-offs is just wrong. Now, by the way, just on Am for Amazon, when Amazon raised it for $15 an hour, they didn't do it to maximize shareholder wealth in an economic sense. They did it to raise shareholder wealth in a political sense, right? They were under huge pressure. Tucker Carlson, Trump, uh, the Democrats, everybody was out to get them on living wages. So they preemptively raised the wage, and now they're lobbying Congress to raise everybody's minimum wages to $15 an hour, which is questionable. But they are trade-offs, and there's only one way to decide on the trade-offs, and that's to pick one goal, one mission, one focus, 
And the focus of shareholder wealth doesn't mean we chain our employees to the machines and whip them three times a day. If I want to make money, I need to treat my employees well. I need them to produce. I need them to be the best that they can be so that my company can be the best that it can be. The same with suppliers. It's not like if I only care about shareholder wealth, I treat my suppliers really, really poorly. The opposite, I treat them really, really well because I need my suppliers in order to make a profit. And the same goes to all important stakeholders. Now, the more removed you are from the company, the fact is the less I care about you. But customers are crucial. I sell them my product. So it's not like I don't care because. How about, how about Am I done? How about his 50 oh. seconds? No. You, you, with my 50 seconds. With, with my 50, your 50 seconds. seconds, okay. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> I think I've said it. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, thank, thank you, Yaron. Now we go to the, uh, uh, the Q&A, the more riotous section of our dramatic evening uh, with Q&A from the audience, Q&A from the moderator, that's my prerogative as well, and uh, Q&A between the two debaters. And so, and mo mostly, and certainly this evening, I'm gonna give each debater the option of asking a question of each other any time. Uh, so uh, first, uh, uh, although you can uh, wait for audience questions for mine and then see oh. if you want to ask a question of the other debater. But at this point, John, do you want to put a question to Yaron at this point, or do you want to wave it until later? I may, I may wait until later, see how, see how the other questions go. I, I I'd want rather to say, hear the questions of the audience. Okay, well, uh, you're going to have to hear a couple of questions from me, too, no. uh, right away. Uh, and. Uh, and so uh, I want to uh, I want to press uh, first uh, with you, with you, John. I want to press Yaron's point that uh, do you see uh, that as Yaron said about the fifteen dollars that you can earn from Whole Foods that do do you see a, at least a societal trade off that it means then that that a, that somebody who cannot produce fifteen dollars worth of value for the company at a profit would then no, no longer be a hire for Whole Foods. Do you see that societal trade-off and how do you deal with it in terms of uh, the overriding purpose of business? What's your answer to that question, John? Well, you have to make a distinction between something that a corporation like Amazon decided to do versus forcing or coercing a min higher minimum wage across the whole society. I would agree that um, forcing a $15 minimum wage would, would result in unemployment for those whose productivity does not warrant $15. Um, in the case of Amazon, although in general I find it's not, I don't like to talk about Amazon in public because there, there's no co corporation in the world that's more in the microscope than Amazon. I will merely make that rebuttal by saying Whole Foods employs over 100,000 people and Amazon employs over 1.5 million people, all making over $15 an hour. So. I mean, that's a lot of people being employed. So the idea that people are losing their jobs is probably not true in Amazon or Whole Foods Market. Um, it cost Whole Foods Market 250 because when we raised our minimum wage, Gene, to 15 bucks, we had to raise everybody's compensation in the whole company because somebody was making $15 and they worked there for three years. Somebody who just started got it would make 10 and they went to 15. Well, we had to raise everybody up. And that total cost to the company was $250 million a year to start out. And I remember I had an argument with Amazon about it. I said, guys, you just, you just raised our cost $250 million. Is that a, is that, is that a, do you want to do that? And they said, yeah, it's worth it to us. We want to do it. But that was a decision that they made. And maybe there, it was probably a complex decision that was made for a lot of reasons, some of which John mentioned. But I do think you have to make a distinction between what a company decides to do and what you should, what the government tries to force everyone else to do. They are not the same. They're different. They have different results. Uh, you have a comment on that, yeah, on, on, the, on John's answer. You have a comment. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a difference. I'm not denying Amazon has a right to raise the minimum wage ever they want. Uh, it would be much, it's on a different dimension if the government does it and the consequences are far more horrific. But even there, one has to recognize that Again, once you extend stakeholders to everybody, some people are not going to be able to ever work at Amazon and at Whole Foods because we've set a, a particular wage. All I was trying to point out is there's a trade-off. It's not win, 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 win. It's not a, an endless array of wins, at least not in the short run. That gives me to my question, other question for John. Um, 
you, uh, you uh, again, the resolution does say that while also enhancing uh, long-term shareholder value, um, do, you, do you ever, uh, do you maintain then that, uh, that enhancing shareholder value, uh, actually I guess it doesn't say long-term, but I, th I believe your intention was to say long-term shareholder value. Do you see any, uh, any con contradiction ever, any trade-off at any time between uh, uh, pursuing the, the overall purpose of, of Whole Foods in terms of its stakeholders and enhancing long-term shareholder value. Is, are, are, the, are the two essentially, are, are the, those goals always compatible? Are there ever difficult choices you have to make as a CEO between the one and the other, the purpose, the stakeholders, and the shareholder value? Is there any, any, any trade-off ever in those terms that you have to deal with? The first point I'll make, yeah, the answer is uh, it's complicated, so let me try to answer it. The first point that Yarn made in that, in the, one of the points he made in the debate was that um, there are like infinite number of stakeholders. And you have to make a distinction between the primary stakeholders who are voluntarily exchanging with the business, which we list as customers, employees, suppliers, investors and uh, the communities that business exists in. Those are the ones that are voluntarily exchanging with the business. Other ones like maybe the government or the media, unions, activists, et cetera, that they could be, they're secondary type stakeholders. So I think you, it's not an infinite number of stakeholders. It's, it's a very select group that are the ones that are most closely tied to the business who are trading with it voluntarily and who the business is trading with voluntarily for mutual gains. Are there trade-offs? The answer is, of course, there are trade-offs, but those trade-offs tend to be a failure of an imagination in my, from my experience. If we seek to not, if we look for trade-offs, we'll find them. But if we seek to look for the win-win-win, we activate our minds to begin to look for solutions creatively that we didn't know existed. And sometimes we fail. Sometimes we're unable to find the win-win-win solution. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means we haven't been able to think of it yet. So while I'll, I'll grant that trade-offs can occur, I don't think they're, I don't think it's, it's, in, it's not in the nature of exchanges for that to necessarily be the case. And, and we just need to think about it differently and activate our creative intelligence, our creative minds. And we will oftentimes find solutions that create win-win-win for all the different stakeholders. That's been my experience. That's my direct experience in business. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my answer. Uh, any comment from you, uh, Jan, on that answer? No, I mean, I, I think I think the the uh, trade offs, you know, the win win win. Yes, you can find solutions where a lot of people are winning, but sometimes those solution means that shareholders, for example, win less, and then that is also a trade off. It's how much you win is also an issue. We're getting back to you. Do you do you believe that there's there would that this is not something you do intentionally in terms of your conscious leadership? Shareholders never win less, uh, John. Would that be your response? Or, or? Well, let me make this point. This is a very important point. You could take any of the major stakeholders, and he says it's it, it's like the Lord of the Rings. Only the shareholders are the ring that unites them all. And anything else, there's too many conflicts. You could take any of the major stakeholders. Let's take the customers, for example. And if if what we wanted to do was seek to optimize customer satisfaction over the long term. Because the stakeholders are all interdependent, the business would be managed the same way. Because you have to maximize profits in order to ultimately maximize customer satisfaction. They are all completely interdependent. You can take, you can try to optimize for any one of the different stakeholders and you will get to the same place because of the long-term interdependencies that all these stakeholders have. That is, that is a very important point that uh, I don't think he sees and probably very few other people see as well. I, I can't remember the exact number, but Apple, I think, is sitting on several trillion dollars of cash right now. Uh, it could, instead of buying back its stock, which is maximizing shareholder wealth, it, it could write a check to its customers. It could send checks to customers. Customers would be better off. 
Amazon would be fine. I mean, uh, sorry, Apple would be fine. Um, yes, its cost of raising capital in the future might rise a little bit, but uh, customers would be ecstatic under those circumstances. But let me add, there is a difference. <laughs> and, and it's an important difference, and it never comes up really. I don't, th you know, I saw it, it came up once or twice in John's, in the book, uh, Conscious Leadership. And that is, who owns the business? Shareholders own the business. There's a passage in which John says, I can't just make decisions in what, what I like at Whole Foods because I'm not the owner. No, he's not. He's an agent of the owners. Right now, the owners are Amazon. But it, when, when it was publicly traded, he was the agent of the shareholders, not of the customers, not of the suppliers, not of any of the other stakeholders. There is an issue here of property rights, which is important. Shareholders have a particular role to play that's not just financial, but as owners of the, the residual claim, which is owners of the business. They get to elect, theoretically, the board of directors who then guides the company. So we can't just treat shareholders as just any other stakeholder. They are the owners of the business. No more than you could treat at your local grocery store, the customers is equal to the guy who owns the grocery store. He gets to make decisions. I have uh, just a final yeah. question. You want to make a comment, John? Go ahead. Wait, wait. Ian, can I quickly respond to that? So I, no one's arguing that the other stakeholders should have ownership rights. I never argue for that. I always argue against that. So of course, the shareholders elect the board of directors and the board of directors holds management accountable for the performance. And no one disputes that. I don't dispute it. Some, I, some people do dispute it, but I do not dispute it. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean just because the owners can fire the management. What I'm arguing for is that the best way to optimize long-term shareholder value is to optimize each of these stakeholders, that there's an interdependence there. I don't think he sees the, I, I don't think Yarn sees the interdependence. That you, it, in seeking to optimize any of the stakeholders, you'll optimize all of them. He's got them sort of like they're pitted against each other, and I see that they are connected together. Um, I'll, I'll well, just say I don't think they're pitted against each other at all. I think it is win-win, but I think that you have to have a decision matrix that, that has one goal, yeah. and by maximizing that goal, you're not, you're, you're helping everybody else. Everybody else is a winner as well. I want, I, I, that segues into my final question before I give it over to the audience. Uh, that directed at Yaron. Uh, the, uh, uh, when, when, when you mentioned, uh, Yaron, just starting with, with the past, uh, that uh, all the achievements of capitalism done by profit maximizing businessmen. Well, uh, I, I, think of, uh, I think of Henry Ford. I think of uh, John D. Rockefeller. Uh, they were, uh, they were uh, nutty philanthropists, among other things. And then uh, I, don't, I haven't read deeply about them, but I know that there must have been a great deal of satisfaction from Rockefeller that he was selling a standard oil that enabled poor people to be able to read at night. Uh, that, uh, that Henry Ford was, 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 was obsessed with his Model T to provide the average man with a car that he could drive. And, uh, and then I look at Yaron Brook, who has a purpose in life uh, to spread the word of capitalism to the world. I think of another uh, 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 standard guy whom I know you are in awe of, John Allison, formerly of the BBT Bank, who, uh, who does preach Ayn Randian uh, self-interest and selfishness. And yet, when I think about John Allison, I say, if that's selfishness, we need more of it. Because John Allison ran a bank with great integrity that was... That whose objective, in his view, had a purpose, and the purpose was, of course, to, to lend money to creditworthy people and to, and to keep alive the spirit of capitalism. So he got up every morning with a purpose. I, I've worked for, for profit maximizing corporations, but I had a purpose. And so, uh, in a way, I guess I want to ask the question of you this way, uh, uh, Yaron, which is that, uh, that you formulated the resolution one way, and, uh, and, and John has formulated it a slightly different way. And then I wonder, is it a question of semantics? Because so many of the people in the room whom I've spoken with, they care about what they do. They, they get up in the morning thinking of, their, of the business they work for as having a purpose. And therefore, if, if, if we have to choose between the one formulation and the other, isn't the formulation about purpose 
a, a much better way to advertise, to represent capitalism to the world. If it's, if it's kind of a, 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 a this or that, a, a, a this or the other, semantically. Because you even agree that every business should have a mission. And you get up in the morning with a mission. So wouldn't it be better in terms of at least presenting capitalism to the world to adopt John's approach rather than yours? That's my challenge to you. Please respond, Yaron. So first I'll say, you know, I'm the last person who's going to be against purpose. I'm a huge believer in purpose. Each individual should have a purpose in life. Um, you all need to craft your own purposes, uh, you know, and, and it's not just one purpose. There might be essential purposes, typically centered around your career, but uh, you can have many purposes. And my, you know, but this is, this is part of the differences. My purpose is, my moral purpose is going to be very different. My moral purpose is my own happiness. So, and that's what gets me up every morning, and everything else is subordinate to that moral purpose, right? I have lots of other purpose, partially to change the world, but partially because I enjoy the battle, partially because I'll be happier in a much better world. Right? So I care about other people because I care about it myself. It goes back to that. So when we say purpose, we conflate it with some higher purpose that somehow needs to be out there. When I think purpose is about maximizing your life, making the most of your life, making the most of the one life you have on here. And I think that the way the proposition that is, is formulated is a comp out with regard to the enemies of capitalism. I think we're buying too much into their premise. I think we're buying too much into their assumptions, into their ideas about capitalism. No, I want to defend profit because I think profit is amazing. I think profit is incredibly, it's a symbol of value creation. I want to defend profit because it's a beautiful thing. I want to defend profit because I love, to use John's word, I love profit. I love life. I love success. I, I, I love striving. I love everything about what business is about. So to, 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 to put profit and shareholder with maximization is kind of also, I think, sells out to our enemies and undermines the, the fight for capitalism in the name of maybe good PR or appealing to their Ethics, but I think their ethics are pretty bad. I think they're going to have to change their ethics if we're going to become capitalists. Uh, you have a comment on that, John, before we go to the audience. Go ahead. You have a comment? Yeah, I disagree. <laughs> I mean, I mean, well, I disagree because, look, imagine for a moment that um, people come to work for Whole Foods and I'm doing the orientation for them. I'm going to say, if I'm following Yaron's philosophy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, they're gonna be there. I'm gonna say, so glad that you're that you come to work for Whole Foods Market. And while you're working for Whole Foods, your purpose is to maximize profits for the company. Any any questions about that? Now, what's a better narrative to to say that or to say, hey, we're so glad you're working for Whole Foods Market. We're trying to sell the healthiest food in the world. We're our purpose is to nourish people and the planet. Which is going to be more inspiring for people? I mean, it, it's it's capitalism fundamentally needs a new narrative in the world. And by the way, I think he falls into the trap of the critics of capitalism by basically granting their premises. Of course, profit is good. I'm not saying that profit is not good. Profit is necessary. But that's not why business fundamentally exists in the world to ma maximize profits as a result of fulfilling its higher purpose. Okay, Yaron has a comment before we go to Q&A. You'll be able to say, go ahead, Yaron. I'll just say, you know, profit is good. Of course it's necessary because it's good. So I, I, I you know, the discomfort about all in on profit, I think is the real fundamental difference between us. Uh, uh, then we're going to go to the audience. You don't have to identify yourself. Uh, just state your question as a question. Uh, so take it away. And, and uh, if your question is directed at either one, say that, or maybe directed at doesn't matter. But uh, take it away. Go ahead. Thanks for bringing the SoHo Forum to Florida. We're, we're actually south. Thank you. We're actually south of Houston Street. Oh, yes, I see. That's um, good to know. <laughs> That's right. We're the Soho Forum, South of Houston. Thank you. Yes. The resolution is about a clearly articulated purpose. Does it matter, uh, Mr. Brooke, if that purpose is 
enhancing shareholder value or, or returns to the, the owners, or uh, for Mr. Mackey, if that purpose is evil, of killing people or doing something bad like that, does that affect your interpretation and your response to the resolution? That's a question for you, for you, John. Did you hear the question? Go ahead, John. Yeah, but I mean, are you asking whether a purpose should be good? Is that is that what you're? I don't. That, that, more clarification on the question because, um, I mean, generally we think a, a higher purpose of a business is is to create value in the world in some place. So uh, doing evil things would not be creating value in the world. So it, in a sense, it wouldn't be ethical, it wouldn't be good, and therefore it's not worthy to be considered a higher purpose. That's my answer. Okay, that's it. Uh, no comment from you, any comment from you? Okay. I, I agree with uh, okay, that. Okay, uh, we have to take this side. Uh, let's go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, the first comment is for John. I liked your explanation of a dialectic world view on the Joe Rogan podcast a few months ago. <laughs> and then, uh, Urin, I have a quick question for you. Do you believe that large media companies like Fox News and CNN purposely disrupt our culture for the maximization of their own shareholders' profit? Wow. <laughs> We've got a provocateur in the question. audience. Go ahead, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that part of making money in media is clickbait, is attention grabbing, it's creating controversy, and getting the culture riled up. And yes, they are they are maximizing their profit. Where and, do you, where do you think that goes too far to like mess with our country for profit? Because I don't, that's see, I don't I don't agree that we are being messed by the media. We're getting what we want. You don't like Fox, stop watching it. I don't. You don't like CNN, stop watching it. I don't. So, so, you know, when the culture is deteriorated, as our culture has deteriorated to the level where clowns like that are dominating our media, we should look at ourselves and question ourselves. Uh, we get the media we deserve. I agree. Okay. What do you think of a company like Cambridge Analytica, though, that purposely stole data Look, in order to use it? Stealing is bad. Again? I don't think anybody's going to disagree with you. Okay. Stealing is bad. It's immoral on a variety of different levels, both in my moral framework and I think in John's moral framework. That, that was a good, so it's it's a good, it's a good question. Thank uh, you. John, John, do you have a comment on the question, on John's answer? The only comment I'll make is that, um, of course, I agree with what Jaron said, that... Uh, um, I don't, I don't disagree with what he said, but there's a slippery slope, I believe, that once we move away from articulating higher purposes for value creation, if it really is just about maximizing profits, it's a slippery slope to people's ethics eroding in order to just maximize profits. When we look at companies like Enron, for example, or companies that that fall off the ethical, uh, what we've considered to be good. They do it primarily because they're, they're just trying to maximize profits. And you can say, well, that won't maximize profits in the long run. But if that's all that matters is profits, I mean, I find it interesting in like the Ayn Rand books like um, Atlas Shrugged, which is one of my all time favorite novels. Um, Henry Reardon, and Dagny Taggart, these individuals they weren't just trying to maximize profits. They were creating value for other people and profits was a result of that. And the passion that they had was what drew people to their mischaracters, in my opinion. So I do think that um, we, have to, uh, we, have to, we have to think that if profit is the only goal, there's a, possibly a slippery slope as people begin to cut corners to maximize those profits. If I could take a moment uh, to, to answer that question as a journalist for more than a quarter of a century, I worked for Barron's Financial Weekly, which was owned by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, they always, my editors always wanted as much sizzle as possible out of what I wrote, but uh, but I drew the line on any sizzle that did violence to facts. I didn't want sensationalism. And of course, I wouldn't, I would have quit the job had they not respected that. And so if, you, if you're a journalist, uh, I don't see how you can look yourself in the morning if you're, if you're spreading just sensational and you're not trying to report the truth and the facts as you see them. And so, and that hopefully maximizes profits for Barron's as it hopefully did in the long run because uh, the, the readership get the impression that you're trying to report the truth as you see it to that readership. And uh, so I didn't see any contradiction there either. Uh, question, uh, sir. How would you analyze a company like Turing Pharmaceutical that 
uh, Who? Turing Pharmaceutical. Turing uh, Pharmaceutical. They they basically exploited a uh, barrier to entry, uh, barring where the FDA bars companies to competing with them, and they uh, bought the rights to a drug that was selling for like twenty dollars a dose, and they jacked it up to eight hundred dollars a dose. Um, it seems to me that they existed uh, purely to make money for their for their shareholders, and if that's the maximum value then would you say that this was a virtuous company? I, I don't remember how well they did long term. I, I don't think they did very well long term. Neither did the shareholders. But uh, let me just note that you know we live in a world, particularly pharmaceutical industry, where it's very heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, what is competition, what is not competition, where does the competition come from, is very complex. And you would have to actually look at the facts of the case and, and look at why the cost. What did they do with the money? Did it go into R&D? And what happened to those people? At least one of those guys landed up in jail, if I remember right, uh, from one of those companies. That, well, an unrelated event, but uh, in a, un, yes, but but it, it's related, right? When you start doing when you start doing completely unethical things, not based on value creation. Remember, I believe the long term profit maximization comes from value creation; it doesn't just come. And I, I do want to address one point that John just made. Of course, what motivates you as an individual is not. I'm going to make money today. I mean, I mean, unless you're in finance, and then yes, it's that's exactly what motivates you. <laughs> uh, it gets me up in the morning. But um, it's it's there is a real passion around what you're doing. That's why I think the mission or the purpose, if you want to use that word, of a company is crucial. It's crucial to motivate you. It's crucial in terms of what business you go into. You might be a CEO. John went into a particular line of business because that's where his passion is, right? And, and, and I think that's crucial. So each one of us as individuals need to pursue our own passion and our own purpose mm -hmm. in pursuit of profit maximization. Well, I'm trying to differentiate between the two of you because it seems that um, well, if uh, it seems like you, you'd have to say Turing Pharmaceutical was behaving virtuously because because if you're trying to say that uh, profit and value are if, equal, if they, I mean, if they sustain this long term and if shareholder wealth is sustained long term, then yes, even if we can't just see the virtue, yes, there was virtue there. We'd have to go in and dig deeper to find it. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, That's my uh, answer. Do you have a comment on that, John? Yeah. Let me jump in here. So I think this this is a very interesting question, and I think it reveals the weakness of Yaron's position ultimately, because he's by saying if maximizing profit is the goal, then it's the goal. It's the highest goal. There is no higher goal than that. And I think he's moving away from that in the debate by saying there is something higher than maximizing profits. Those profits need to be earned ethically. So there is a purpose higher than maximizing profits. And he tries to get around it by arguing for the long term, over the long term, over the long term. But you know what? There are plenty of bad people who maximize profits, and they maximize them over the long term as well because they're not caught. They get away with it. And uh, there's not justice and there's not always done. So I don't think even your own position, maximizing profits is the goal. Maxim ma maximizing profits is... Your your goal is is there's some type of ethical code that stands above maximizing profits. I think it's implicit in the argument you just made. Next question. Yeah, my question's for John. Whereas absent coercion, profit money is an expression of preference. Uh, how could you measure your success in the way that you fulfill your higher purpose and improve others' lives? This is you used a quantitative. Uh, word, and this is a qualitative statement, how exactly do you measure uh, how you fulfill you, the higher purpose and improve other people's lives? How do you... You can measure, you can, it's, we don't have as good a measurements for all the different stakeholders, for example, um, but there are ways to measure customer satisfaction, for example, net promoter scores, as well as surveys can measure it. You track it over time. You see, you track it versus the industry, you track it versus other companies. You can measure um, employee satisfaction. Um, uh, there, are, there are measurements that we can do that um, I, I'm slipping my mind right now, but the um, Glass door, that's the one that is a good way to measure employee satisfaction. You can compare companies against each other. Each one of the different stakeholders has me measurements so you can see how you're doing vis-a-vis -vis them. I guess the, the thing that I think where Yarn and I 
part company is I see the inter interdependence. It's clear to me. I live it. I see it every day as I build a business. And it is possible to optimize all of these stakeholders. It's not perfect. It's messy. There can be short-term trade-offs. And um, but you know where, where we agree is that ultimately we do want to seek to make lots of money over the long term because we believe that's good for the economy, good for the world. Profits help drive the engine, the energy that drives everything forward. And I I agree with him that, and I applaud that defense of profits because profits are are attacked unfairly and ruthlessly. I'm just I see something that I don't think he sees. And uh, that's why I think we disagree. Or he, he would say he sees things I don't I don't see either. But um, that's why we have a debate. I, okay, I got, a follow uh, wait, wait. I got a, one follow up for you. If I'm the CEO of Eric Inc. and my stakeholders include, you know, uh, my girlfriend, she's having a bad day, and there's cigarette butts on the bus stop at the easement outside of Whole Foods. Am I on the clock? Can I be texting? Can I go pick up cigarette butts? Or am I to maximize my benefit to you by checking out ca uh, customers as quickly as possible. Okay, you got the dilemma, John. Uh, that's a moral, uh, Go ahead. Is, yeah, did you get the question? No, I don't really understand it. Okay, I tell you what. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I have to say that now we, we just want uh, these two people, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but uh, to inspire the summary statements, just state your question. We can't, uh, don't have time for an answer, but there will be summaries from each of the debaters, and maybe they'll take into account your question. So r just state your question, sir, and then, uh, and then we'll go to the next one. What's your question? A absolutely. It's kind of like a twofold. It's one, what is to prevent what we've already seen, which is major corporations using vast amounts of money to influence government to prevent anybody in from competition and then on the other side of that when you talk about the greater community and and being involved in your community what is to prevent what we've seen over the last year which are in the last 10 years with cancel culture from influencing greatly people who are profitable for a company say like a gina carrera getting fired from disney plus or even people who are getting hired for accounting jobs being asked how they'll end systemic racism how do we prevent those two extremes okay thank you and then uh, your question sir yeah this was for yarin um with the extreme difficulty and high failure rate of new business owners and entrepreneurs, uh, how do you think that the purpose doesn't increase their likelihood of success versus if it's someone who's just looking for a good idea to make money? The high failure rate. Okay. Uh, and your question, sir? Uh, quick two questions. Yaron, if we replace the word um, enhance it with maximizing, would you agree with the proposition? And secondly, as far as value creation, the PR problem that you spoke about, would it be good to find common ground with people like John, who used to be a democratic socialist, is now a um, successful capitalist, to change young people from anti-capitalist to capitalist with kind of his inspirational message? Thanks. Okay, and then your question? Uh, my question is to John. Um, he said Atlas Shrugged is his favorite book, but uh, uh, the major theme of the no, book... I didn't say that. Oh, well, you said it's one of your Whatever. favorite books, right? You enjoyed it. But you know, the main theme is that altruism is incompatible with capitalism. And you are trying to make altruism compatible okay. with this economic system when really you should be defending self-interest. That's the only thing consistent with it. Okay, I heard that comment. And then your, your my, question. Yeah, my question is for John. John, when you, when you have a scenario where a decision might be conflicting between some primary stakeholder and your shareholders... I'm wondering if you have a clear set of principles that help you or that guide your decision making. I would I would imagine any shareholder would like to understand that the leadership has clear principles that guide their decisions when a decision might conflict between a primary stakeholder and a shareholder. Thank you. And your question? Thank you. Very similar question for John, which is, what if the two are competing interests? Let's say that you have to make that decision between your altruistic yes. purpose versus the profit. Okay. And where does that uh, stand? Thank you. Okay, John, you're going to cover all of those questions in the five minutes that you have for your summation. I can't do that. I didn't write them down. Someone will have to. Somebody has to remind me of the question. Or I mean, uh, I can take them one at a time. I can't take them all. Give me one or two. John, uh, we, we are going to the summation portion of the evening. John has five minutes as the affirmative to sum up. Sum up. So take it away, John. Five minutes. Go ahead. Okay, that was to help 
feed my summation. Okay, I get it. <laughs> um, this has been an interesting debate, and uh, uh, Yarn, I look forward to carrying it on in private sometime uh, when we and I can talk, and I'm sure it'll be it'll be a rich discussion. So this is not a we don't have enough time to do this properly, and uh, uh, I can see you're a very passionate man, and you and you and you are you believe in capitalism and liberty, and so do I. We 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 disagree on two or three percent, and agree on 97, 98 percent, and so we're really brothers, not not enemies here. Um, however, as I put up in my initial presentation, I showed that um, capitalism has done all these amazing things in the world, and yet it's it's so disliked and it's so distrusted. And I I believe it's primarily a it's a marketing problem, and and it's because we've let the enemies of capitalism define it as greedy and selfish and exploitative. That it is only cares about money. It's only about maximizing profits. Who cares if if the pharmaceutical industries are Screwing people or whatever, they're maximizing profits. And I think trying to defend capitalism on that basis, that's that's what I think it falls into the trap of the, our enemies. Because the reality is human beings are both self-interested and we are altruistic. We are both. We are complex beings. These things matter to us. We we do seek our own good and we seek the good of other people. It's satisfactory. It it. To, to give to others and help others is intrinsic to human nature. And I don't like to have that, that argument turned around and said, that just means they're selfish about helping other people, because to me, that's the contradiction. So maximizing profits is a good thing. It's just simply not the purpose of business. The purpose of business is to create value for other people. Profits is the result of that. The more value we create for people, the more money that we will make because it's done through voluntary exchange. If we want to promote capitalism, that's the narrative we need to tell. We need to talk about our purpose. We need to talk about the values that we're creating, the goodness and values that we're creating for other people. If we do that, capitalism's terrible reputation will begin to shift and change. As long as we're going to try to argue that it's all about making money and maximizing profits over the long term, we're going to lose this argument. And you know what? We're going to lose capitalism because we're going to become a socialistic society. I strongly urge people to begin to, all business people, whenever I get a chance, I always talk about, talk about the value creation you're giving. Yes, you're making money. That's a good thing because our society needs money. That's what drives the economy. But from an ethical standpoint, we're never going to convince people that selfishness is good and greed is good. That's a losing argument. What we can do, we can win this argument in the world if we will talk about the value creation and that profits are therefore important because they drive the economy upwards and onwards and human, humanity will continue to make progress. If we don't change our narrative, we're going to lose it all. That's, that's my deepest fear and why I continue to champion conscious capitalism, higher purpose, and stakeholders. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, five minutes of summation from you, Yaron. Take it away. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and yes, John, looking forward to that private conversation. It's going to be, it, it'll be a lot of fun. And I agree. Uh, there's a, somebody asked about common ground. Uh, absolutely. We're obviously both passionate about capitalism. We both have a view about what is the best way to promote it and what is underlying the fundamental premises underlying it. And uh, that is a debate worth having. Uh, and I think the mall debate is a debate worth having. I, for one, do not know anybody who says that they only care about money. That is a, a, that is a, a straw man. Nobody says that. The question is, what is the purpose of a business in a particular context, in your particular life? Not, what is your purpose? Your purpose might be different than a business's purpose. But what is a business created to do? as compared to any other institution that human beings have constructed. And it is created to do one thing, and that is create value in a particular way. There are lots of ways to create value. And many of them don't result in profit. 
Financial profit. You know, I think I create some value for my wife on occasion. Uh, she certainly <laughs> creates value for me, right? But it's not about profit. It's not about money, right? A business is where it is about money. A business is where we measure the quantity of value created with money, in a sense, with profit or with shareholder maximization, the shareholder of value. That's how we're measuring the creation of value. So the end is the value, there's no question. What moves the world forward is the value. But whether that value is small or whether that value is big is measured through the profit. When profit is large, when a company makes a lot of money, I celebrate. It means they've made a lot of value. They've created a lot of value in the world. It is a good thing, not a bad thing. So I think that what integrates the decision-making of a business is this idea of how do we make money doing it. And I agree completely that everything's interdependent. And I mentioned that. In order to make money doing that, we have to deal with employees in such and such a way, and we have to deal with our suppliers in such and such a way, and we have to create a product that our customers actually like, and like a lot so that our profit margins can be high. You know, I'll refer to Apple with regard to profit margins being high, right? So, of course it's interdependent, because there's no way for me to actually maximize profit unless I bring in all these other, call them stakeholders, into the fold, and unless you know, their resources are mustered to enable the creation of value. And the only way to do that is for them to benefit as well. Um, of course, everything I say is in the context of moral behavior. It would be bizarre for anybody to come and say, yes, I believe in profit, and if you have to lie, steal, and cheat, that's okay, as long as it's profit. The underlying assumption, the implicit assumption, is always that we're doing it ethically. I also think that ethics is profit maximizing. Uh, I think there's no accident that Enron stock, did you ever see what happened to it? We all know where Enron stock got to zero, right? Ethical behavior pays. Uh, unethical behavior is punished. Punished by the authorities when it's illegal and punished by the marketplace when it might not be illegal but it's still unethical. So purpose is amazing. The purpose of business is to maximize shareholder wealth. And the only way to maximize shareholder wealth is by creating value. And to when, know, to focus your energies about a particular area in which you're maximizing shareholder wealth, because you know there's a million opportunities out there to make money. How do you know where to focus it? That is where your passion, that is where your mission, that is where your personal purpose comes in. That's why it should be framed, the maximizing shareholder wealth should be framed within the context of your mission, your purpose, your passion, your particular values. I would be, you know, I don't think John should go in to start competing with Apple. That's not where passion is. It's not where he's interested. He might be smart enough to compete with him, but it's not where his interests are. That's what purpose frames the context in which one maximizes long-term profits. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Okay, now we come to the Jane Money of the evening. Jane, please open the final vote. Please open your cell phones and cast your final vote. Again, uh, yes, no, or undecided. You can remain undecided if you voted undecided. You can say yes if you voted yes initially. Uh, just uh, how do you vote now after listening to either uh, and both debaters, uh, a clearly articulated purpose, consciously embodied by the leadership, should be an essential element in all business organizations, while also enhancing shareholder value. Uh, I want to thank both debaters for a uh, very spirited and very courteous uh, debate. It's what we pursue. There was no character assassination during this debate, and uh, that's what we eschew at the SOA Forum. This is the kind of debate we want to put on. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, uh, John's book, uh, John is unfortunately not here to, to do book signing, but his book is available, Conscious Leadership. Uh, Yaron will be doing book signing and sales for $20, Yaron. 
Twenty dollars uh, for that book, uh, and uh, it's uh, well worth it. It's a bargain at twenty. I can certainly tell you that. And um, uh, I just want to announce then that uh, the uh, that we will be up at Porkfest in late June. We have the results on the debate. It was a sort of close heat. Uh, the the yes votes initially were forty five point eight seven percent, but lost by. 4.5 points, so down to 4.1. So therefore, John lost a couple of points, and Yaron gained uh, by 19. So Yaron gets the Tootsie Roll. But essentially, it was a very, it was very close. It was basically a, a little less than half voting for, a little less than half voting no. Uh, it was very close. But Yaron picked up more points from the initial to the final, and therefore Yaron wins the Tootsie Roll. Congratulations, Yaron, and thank you, John. Thank you.